So, hello everybody. My name is Han Yang. I'm the Nexus 1000B product manager. It's good to have all of you with us. I'll be sharing with you what we're doing along the lines of VXLAN, or Virtual Extensible Local Area Network. We've been working with Nexus 1000B for quite some time, and it's amazing how this product has progressed, right? But what most of our customers are looking to do these days is to build clouds. And clouds are a wonderful place to be because while you can put in workloads on demand, elastically, it's great. But for those of us that actually have to build a cloud, we actually have to map these elastic virtual workloads onto something physical, like real physical servers, real network that's connecting all those servers. And as soon as you get into the network land, there's something called layer two domains and layer threes and subnets and all that. And so it's incumbent upon us, those, who, those of us that actually have to build a cloud to be able to map that workload to physical infrastructures even though that workload is elastic, right? Because they come and it goes. And sometimes, gosh darn it, there is so much workload that the initial set of infrastructures, initial set of physical infrastructures, may not be able to support the increasing amount of virtual workload that's coming in. And therefore, you need to add in more servers and networks. And how do you do that, right? Because especially in a virtualized environment, we've all been accustomed to having a flat layer two network. Because a flat layer two network is what enables you to do uh, live migration of virtual machines from one server to another. Well, okay. So you can grow your layer two network to a certain degree, and Cisco's got plenty of technology to help you out to grow it to ever larger amount of layer two. But as you do that, you might have these issues such as, well, I may have to resubmit my IP address at some point. That's a pretty painful process, right? Or customers are asking, can, you, can I simply grow a second layer two domain, but still have my virtual machines talk to each other? And as I do this, can I make sure that my physical network continues to be uh, well utilized as I do these things? This is the genesis of VXLAN. This is the networking problem that, as I talk to service providers and even private clouders all over the world, they're all experiencing the same problem, right? How do you make sure that you have a network that can scale to the cloud and with increasing amount of tenants and application for each of those tenants, and to be able to grow my physical infrastructure along the way to be able to do all this? So today, as my uh, thing works with me, we're going to be talking about VXLAN and what it means and how do we come to build VXLAN with our industry partners and how do we come to make sure that VXLAN is a robust networking service capable of doing things like, well, in case you want to do some firewall on your traffic on VXLAN, or oh, maybe you want to do data center interconnect along with that so that you can work between data centers and so on and so forth. So these are some things that we'll be talking about today. Okay. So my magic stick isn't working. All right. So what we've built over the last several years from Cisco on the Nexus 1000 V team is we started as a layer two virtual switch and what we ended up today is a switching platform capable of supporting a variety of virtualized network services including things like virtual security gateway, ASA 1000 V, of course the Nexus 1000 V its own virtual supervisor module, uh, virtual WAS and so on. So in many ways this is a uh, switching platform that's got, it's a distributed modular switch where we have a VSM, the virtual active standby, the software line cards, or we call it virtual ethernet module. This is a piece of Cisco software running the kernel of the hypervisors. We're currently supporting VMware, and we already announced our intent to support Microsoft Hyper-V uh, when, when that comes out. We're able to have a feature called VX, I'm sorry, called VPath, or virtual it's an architecture that enables us to support a variety of virtualized network services, and we support things like VXLAN. In fact, Next Cisco shipped VXLAN just about two months ago, right? And we actually shipped a virtual security <coughs> gateway or a virtual firewall supporting VXLAN at the same time. We'll be talking a bit more about that through the course of the presentation today, okay? I don't see a VACE up there. 
Good question. So you're asking Cisco, when is Cisco going to round out an additional amount of virtualized network services? Well, the fact that we have a B path to start with is actually our architecture to be able to support increasing the amount of virtualized network services over time. And you know what? That's a great feedback to our ACE team that can help you with when we're going to have that type of virtual uh, application content engine over time. Nice. You'll be amazed to see what we're having in store. <laughs> so That sounded like Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I haven't said the word amazing yet, you know? <laughs> you just did. Magical. That's magical. That's magical, okay. okay. No. Magical's coming up the list. This is just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I'm, just, I'm just the first speaker of the day, right? So all I have right. to warm up the crowd for all the more increasingly exciting things to come, right? So, so you get so coffee and sugar on the way in, and then we turn your list over. You, in case you haven't <laughs> noticed, right, I'm the product manager of the Nexus 1000V, right? It is actually the smallest number numerically from the, in the Nexus family, right? Even though the Nexus 1000V has actually more modules that it so can So you support. are just saying that you're going to see 7K virtualized? Nexus 7000V. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, it's official. It, it's, it's amazing, it's amazing that our, our, yeah. our favorite friends yeah. are able to help us plan our roadmap. That's the kind of things that we like, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how do we get to, into all this VXLAN stuff, right? Well, when VM were first yeah. introduced vCloud Director, when we first learned about it, then we realized, gosh, okay, this cloud notion requires the network to be able to instantly instantiate lots and lots of segments to be able to support increasing amount of uh, tenants, increasing amount of applications on those tenants, right? In fact, vCloud defines all sorts of networking models. There is a uh, isolated network, fence network, directly connect network, different tiers of network from a VApp perspective, from a uh, enterprise perspective, from a service provider perspective. All of these constructs require specific support from the networking infrastructure to make this successful, right? And in fact, this gets even more complicated because, well, each VApp or each collection of virtual machines has, might be a three-tier application, right? A web front end, a database, application logic middle end, a database back end. And they all require a different network segment. And vCloud and other applications like it allow you to instantiate lots of these vApps on demand, forcing you to create individual network segments for each of these, each instance of these applications. Okay. Uh, if I may a comment on the slide, not Please. the content. The slide has a serious flaw, and this is what uh, VMware is promoting, and it's wrong, because if you wire things together like this, then you have real problem upgrading the software in that VMs if they want to reach the internet or whatever server to download the software and upgrade it. Just saying. <laughs> oh, if you, if you wire it like this, the, uh, if the database needs to access the internet, it needs to go to the app? And the web, and the web, and the edge gateway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. It is so good to have such an illustrious talented and <laughs> most of all no <laughs> for a different perspective from from our panel here right and, and Omar uh, you know indicated to me Han be prepared for all sorts of questions that may come this way so thank you for the feedback <laughs> but most of all from a networking perspective how in the world are we going to create so many logical segments right in a world that's been dominated by IEEE 802.1Q with 4,000 VLANs for such, for 20 some odd years, I don't even know how far it goes back, that 4,000 VLANs simply might not scale enough to the type of capability that a cloud would demand. In fact, others that propose things like, oh, I don't know, maybe a layer two extension, maybe a Mac and Mac extension, right? But the thing is that that type of approach constrains the solution to be still within a layer two boundary. Right? It's not able to cross layer two boundaries, and some have even proposed a Mac and Mac solution where, well, you, you can't even take advantage of your port channel as well, because in a port channel, you're usually hashing the traffic. If you use a Mac and Mac with the same source, the same destination, you'll probably hash the same physical link. So you might have a port channel of, let's say, four physical links, but you end up using just one of them. Right? So these are some of the pragmatic problems that, as we look at this, solutions that have been proposed, it's like, gee, Cisco can really you know, 
lend a hand and help with our partners to be able to round out a more holistic solution that all of our customers are encountering as they build their cloud infrastructure. This is why Cisco works so hard to make sure that we're able to lend our, is it 25, 26 years of networking expertise to help out the industry, to help our, our customers, to come up with a way to be able to produce a scalable network isolation mechanism that we call VXLAN today. I won't share with you all the, um, all the political inside details that it took to create a emerging standard with so many of our partners. The story is a, it's a very interesting and very um, rewarding one, right? It's a rewarding one. <laughs> Do I hear chuckles out there? <laughs> it's a rewarding one because so many of our partners today are endorsing VXLAN, right? And so many of them are converging upon a single solution that can help our customers that scales in so well, right? So VXLAN, in its simplest form, is quite simple, right? You take the original Ethernet frame, you put it in a VXLAN encapsulation. In fact, the VXLAN encapsulation is one based on UDP. It's an IP encapsulation, so you allow you to cross the three boundaries. It also has a 24-bit VXLAN ID, enabling you to create an architectural maximum of over 16 million logical segments. Okay. So it's 4,000 times more than what you can have with VLANs. Okay. Now, just because it's using a layer three tunnel doesn't mean that the virtual machines will see all this stuff, right? The virtual machines continue to see its own layer two. You can even think of it as bridge domain, right? All the networking magic is happening at the sw virtual switch level. The virtual machine just sees its own bridge domain, oblivious to whatever's happening underneath the covers. What was it? Magically, amazingly, uh, excitingly, right? <laughs> and we're using IP multicast as part of the infrastructure to be able to send out the virtual machines, broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast type of traffic. And I'll walk you through that in a lot more detail in the course of the presentation today. Okay? So this um, is, yes? Uh, I have a question. So I've, I've, I've understand, understood VXLAN to um, give, you 20, uh, give you 16 million logical networks. Um, I didn't realize the VXLAN ID was 24 bits, so that means it's 16 million, 4,000, so the 16 million times 4,000, so it's like 68 billion. Wow, okay, so the, now, now you're talking a bigger number than, than my, than the, than my ranking accommodated this early day, hour of the day, but what's, what you need to realize is that the 24-bit VXLAN ID is a flat identifier space mm -hmm. independent of your VLANs. Right, so that would mean I would have 16 million possible networks, and those networks would com could comprise of, because we still have the uh, internal header of... Um, yeah, uh, you could, but the, 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 the you have first the implementation problem, because then you would have to do guest tagging mm -hmm. in today's implementation, and then you also have the scalability problem. So you're articulating the fact that, hey, Han, there's an inner dot one Q yeah. tag possible, and a <coughs> outer 24-bit VXLAN ID, giving you like two to the 24 plus 12, right? 36. That's, yeah. your, that's your question, right? Yeah. So the answer is, this 24-bit VXLAN ID is typically used by a service provider, your cloud provider, right? So that he's able to create a lot of, support a lot of tenants, and each tenant might wanting to have different network isolate from each other even for their applications. Right, so I could have I could have sixteen million networks, each of them with up to four thousand VLANs, four thousand whatever. The four thousand VLAN that's for this dot one Q tag is primarily used by the virtual machine themselves. Right. right. Yes, tagging. So yeah, so, so this is almost in place of VLANs of the VLAN. You can you could tag on the host, but you're using VXLAN to tr shuttle traffic between the hosts rather than VLANs directly. Correct. So it, could you, you said something interesting about tenants or between applications. In our, in my environment, um, that I've been really outspoken about this. Uh, yes. Ivan has <laughs> heard me say this, is that um, for me, a security zone is a tenant. So you, I could spin up a v, VXLAN ID for each isolated web tier, for each isolated uh, app tier. It's not, it's, 
a tenant could be a security guard. That's only that's yeah, when we talk about tenants, it's not purely an SP. I mean, it could be different departments in an, in an yeah. enterprise. It could be a private cloud. Just groups want to arbitrarily separate. Doesn't, yeah, uh, arbitrarily yeah, yeah, all I'm saying is, is I, had, I had a little bit of misunderstanding, and I just want to clear this up. So my understanding was is I got 16 million VLANs. But this yes. seems to indicate that that was incorrect. Uh, but uh, I, have I, I think you million. still have it because you have the outer dot one two tag. Right. So without inner tagging, you have sixteen million VLANs. Uh, you have right. sixteen million VX lands, right? Yes. Right. So, I, I've, yeah, I've, yeah, so VX right. would, might not be the right <laughs> word for it because. So our, what, what, so what, what, what? VX LAN, so we are adding Q &Q. more things into Q &Q. the. Uh, you can embed VLAN tags so, inside of VX So, LAN. gentlemen, right? But, but you can have, but you can have 4,096 uh, inner VLANs. Right, so, gentlemen. Let me let me clarify yeah. this bottom diagram a little for you. Right, we have the original <laughs> Ethernet frame in green, right, with a dot one cube optional. It is encapsulated in VX LAN with a 24 bit, and there is the UDP encap. Right. Notice that I'm more complete than I need because this outer dot one Q and the this three segments is actually the uh, transport VLAN of the VXLAN packet, right? So yeah, in, 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 I'm showing you more information that I need here because in, in, in theory, all I need is uh, these particular IP type of end cap. But we also realize that in real networks, as you put out this layer three packet, it's right, we're probably writing on a particular transport VLAN in terms of layer two. And that's where this stuff comes in, right? So I'm transporting on a particular, this UDP packet is transporting on a layer two transport VLAN with its own source and destination max, right? So, so there's a lot of information in this one frame format diagram here. But they're actually in different contexts as you right. kind of scope in, right? So I could have, so theoretically, I could have 16 million VXLANs, and each one of those VXLANs could have up to 4,000 VLANs inside of it. So when you say inside of it, are you talking here, or are you yeah, talking yeah. I'm here? I'm talking... The green one. Yeah. Okay, sure, yeah. And okay, in fact, so I just wanted to clarify that, because my understanding was I got 4,000 VXLANs, and each of them could have 4,000, that and that's how I got to 16 million. So I actually have even more VLANs than I thought I did, or VXLANs than I thought I did. Okay, cool. <laughs> We good? <laughs> All right. What's the price of admission right there? Uh, just a question on the packet form. Okay. Uh, somewhere I read that it is compatible with OTB and Lisp. Is that true or not? I mean, I could go and read the standard, but it's easier to ask. <laughs> uh, the answer is the frame format here is very similar okay. to that of OTV and Lisp. Okay. The difference is that they're running different protocols sure. and the semantics are a little different. Yeah. And uh, we'll go into some of the, uh, the why we do all this mm -hmm. in a later uh, slide. But the frame format is the same, as the length of the header is the same. Yes. So you already have the hardware to support it on the next 7,000. As a virtual switch guy, I don't have to talk about it. I don't think okay. about the hardware. <laughs> but for the next 7,000 PM, we'll be happy to answer your question. Are you going to talk about the multicast element here? Yes. Actually, it's coming in right out, right? So the, the, the cool thing about VXLAN is that the virtual machines could be on, let's say, VXLAN 5500. I'm just picking a number, right? And the virtual machines, they all think of themselves as being on VXLAN 5500 in this case. But the physical host that is supporting these virtual machines might end up being in different layer two domains, right? And that's the value of the tunnel, right? Because the virtual machines, you're basically abstracting the network that the virtual machine sees, namely a scalable bridge domain. But when in fact the packet themselves are transported, possibly crossing layer three boundaries and enabling you to have servers on different layer two domains, right? Why do we do this? This means that, well, on day one, I can have a layer two domain with some networks and servers and so on supporting some limited number of virtual machines. On day two, as my virtual workload grows, I can start up a second layer two domain with additional servers and networks and so on. But the virtual machines continue to communicate and think that I'm still on my own layer two bridge domain. I don't see any difference, right? And now all of a sudden, I have an architecture that I can scale and grow. In fact, 
I can have identical physical pods of servers and network enabling me to kind of scale out my physical infrastructure in support of increasing the amount of virtualized workload. This is the value of the XI. Okay. Now. Is this logo with the circle on it? Is that a base X question? Ah, thank you for that question. Thank you for that question. <laughs> this is the Cisco icon for the virtual Ethernet module of the Nexus 1000B, representing an individual server, because there's only one virtual Ethernet module per physical server. So in our case, each one of these things is basically a server. Connected up to a upstream physical switches, maybe a copper rack switch, let's say, going to some sort of a distribution router, right? And now you have replicated pods across. Loop prevention. What about loop prevention? So if you drew a, a blue line from, get, get rid of the red line. Uh-huh. You drew a blue line from that VM in that first pod on the left. Yeah. Or, or the, no, no, the other one, yes. Uh -huh. Line up over to the... Um, to where? There you go. To yeah. this one? Sure. Yeah? So is there potentially a loop there? Uh, there, there's always a potential for loop. So I how do you stop it? <laughs> there's always a potential for loops, okay? There are also built-in mechanisms to prevent loops as well, right? The fact that, so from pure Nexus 1000V perspective, we actually have multiple loop prevention mechanisms built in. First of all, virtual switches do not participate in spanning trees. Right? They don't have to because they're at the leaf of the network, right? And there's only one virtual Ethernet module per server, so it's not like I'm going to build a loop inside a single server. Now, in fact, if the virtual Ethernet module sees a packet with a source MAC address of one of its own virtual machines, it will assume that, ah, the physical network has looped, and it will actually drop that packet, okay? And uh, if, it's, if it sees a BPDU coming from the outside physical switches, it'll drop that too. So it won't cause a loop for the outside physical network. Right? So there's a number of built-in loop prevention techniques that's into the Nexus 1000V. Yes? What are they? What? What are they? How do they work? Wow. I mean, you, you obviously, yeah, I mean, yesterday we had a deep mathematical explanation how WAN optimization works. <laughs> I just want to get the answers, not there are mechanisms. Yeah, we know there are mechanisms. How do you solve that particular problem? So there are three of them in mind. I remember, I can only remember two out of the three, okay? okay. So <laughs> That's okay. We'll get my techno marketing engineer to tell you the third one, right? The first Fine, can we get him? Okay. We'll work on that. Okay. <laughs> Omar, you didn't tell me I was going to be inquisitive, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you forgot the, you got, you, you got to get a bigger uh, spotlight into my head, right? It's like, Han, you got to talk now! Okay. So, you you'll, have to, you'll have to forgive us. Our nerd meter got recalibrated yesterday. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. We are. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the two mechanisms. Okay. Well, see, we have some history here. Omar, you need to brief us better on these type of engagements, right? So the loop prevention mechanisms are the fact that if you see a source MAC coming in from the outside world, it's matching one of your own, you drop that. EPDUs are dropped, and I don't remember the third one. So, uh, okay. so th these are the basic, th the basic threes. What was the it, it works kind of like the same way oh, that VMware works. From 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 in VMware, outside. you can have BPDs. Oh, you won't basically split Horizon. Yeah. Okay. Right. You're, yeah, not yeah. Gonna, you're not going to receive a packet and then you ship it right out, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's that's similar, similar to the way that, for example, uh, uh, VPLS would do. If you receive it from the cloud, yeah. you don't send it back yeah, to the cloud. Yeah, VM, VEM does not act like a traditional switch, just like a vSwitch in VMware does not act yeah. like a traditional switch. Mm -hmm. There's no spanning tree. You can do active-active because no split horizon. Okay. To the upstream switch, it looks like a host. Uh, and to answer maybe Derek's question in more details, uh, you can't create a loop as long as you stay within one VXLAN because it's just IP transport. If someone is stupid enough to have VM with two NICs and bridge them together and do that twice in the network, then they just, just messed up their VLANs. Yeah. There's nothing you can do. Other than running spanning tree, but uh, no, no. Other good. than turning on source max security in VMware, okay. which would kill anything. Okay. okay. <laughs> so there was a question earlier about multicast, right? So how does traffic forwarding work in a VXLAN environment? Mm -hmm. It actually works very similar to a traditional layer two switch, right? In a traditional layer two switch, if you don't know how to, where to send it, you receive it and you broadcast it out on every other. Right? And as traffic comes back, you do learning of the MAC address, voila. You do MAC learning, and that's how uh, layer two switches work. 
In VX land, we do very similar things, except that you're learning on the tuple of the MAC address and the host VXLAN IP address. That's what you learn on, right? And when you're doing a broadcast, multicast, or unknown unicast, we're using the IP multicast mechanism to be able to send out the traffic to imitate a flood. Right? I'll walk you through that in a lot more detail. And once you've learned everything, that is the location of your destination, you can simply do the encapsulation and send it directly using IP unicast, okay? So therefore, the mechanism of a VXLAN is very similar to a traditional layer two switch with the exception that you're learning on the tuple of uh, MAC address, just like a layer two switch, and the VXLAN IP address, right? So let me kind of walk you through this step by step, right? So let's say you have three servers, three Nexus 1003 virtual ethernet modules, and let's say that I start a blue web VM. As I start that up, this server will join a particular multicast group, let's say 239.1.1.1, okay? And as a second VM, also on the blue VX LAN shows up, this server too will join the same multicast group because they're trying to be on the same VX LAN. In a similar way, so multicast group per VX LAN? In the current example, and I'll, I'll, I'll broaden that in a moment, right? Well, thank you, Chris. In a similar way, you can have a red web VM and a red database VM that's on the red VXLAN. And when those machines are fired up, the virtual Ethernet modules will also join a separate multicast group, in this case, 239.2.2.2, to enable all these servers to be registered on the same uh, particular multicast group, right? Now, what happens when you want to do a broadcast? Well, when the blue web VM does a broadcast traffic, it's encapsulated and sent via multicast. In this case, the router in the middle will send it to the server in the middle here, but not to the server on the left, because only this server has been registered for the 239.1.1.1 multicast group. In a similar way, when the red, the, uh, red web VM sends a broadcast traffic, it too will be encapsulated and sent via multicast to the server in the middle, but not to the server on the left. So when you're talking red and blue, are you talking a, a VXLAN ID or a VLAN in a VXLAN? Let's just keep it simple, just a VXLAN. Okay. Okay, so we're talking about the blue VXLAN, red VXLAN. So, they're emulating a flooding domain. Right, but uh, be, so that... Would you have the same, it's probably stupid, but would you have the same v, VLAN inside the VXLAN? Is that the assumption? Usually you wouldn't. Yeah, because I got a two, wouldn't. Yeah. Like, say frames frames would usually not be tagged. No VLAN. Okay. Oh, you're not going to use VLAN. Oh, okay. Normally yeah. you're not okay. Normally it's an access VLAN. Because otherwise... Because it's an access LAN. Yeah, because otherwise I could have really bad flooding issues if exactly. I have like a thousand yeah. VLANs well, inside... Well, you, you haven't solved anything if you put VLANs inside VXLAN. Because most right. of the... you still hit the limit. Yeah. Then you hit the yeah. Yeah. Most okay. of the okay. VAPs in questions are relatively simplistic, right? Yeah. It's not like, you know, it's, it's, it's a three-tier network. It's just, you know... The three layers, right? And it's not, you don't have a lot of fancy things. So let's say, let's say it, so in a single V app, or a single yeah, V app, I had three VLANs to separate out my database web and app traffic. So if I did a broadcast for on my database VLAN, it would also. Um, great question, right? I think, no. I, great question, right? So hang on a sec. Your th so in a traditional physical network, what you just described is absolutely right, okay? But as you and in, in some cus so as you go for VXLAN, right, you actually have a lot more VXLANs, so therefore you can do this much more easily. Now, some customers today, to conserve VLANs, might put all three of them on the same VLAN and might even use firewalls for that isolation that you desire. In transparent right. mode. Right, so therefore, as you have more VXLANs, your designs might change because, well, I, I got 16 million to burn, right? So therefore, I don't, I don't have a, as a strong desire to conserve VLANs as I did in the traditional VLAN world, right? Except, so the fact that, except that each VXLAN needs a multicast tree. 
So your scale becomes the number of multicast trees that you need to handle yes. the multicast. Great question. Great question. Hold on to that question. Okay. Let me wait for two slides. Sure. We'll answer that one. And I don't necessarily like that, that connotation. That's like saying because we have IPv6, we're going to throw out all good IP planning designs just because we have a crap load more VLANs. You have the flexibility to do so. Uh, Doesn't mean Josh, that you you will. You in traditional design, you would have web tier, app tier database. Tier. I get that. I, I, I just didn't like the the analogy. That we now should. you have web tier, app tier, DB tier, three VX lands. But to Tony's point earlier, not necessarily. You might be building an entire environment, an isolated environment under a VX land tag with four thousand VLANs. That was your point earlier. Yeah, but you just destroy the scalability of VXLAN doing that. Because all of a sudden you turn a number of VLANs into one flooding domain again. Yeah, because, yeah, so that, that was my question. It, yeah. it's a, it, so I just wanted to make sure I understood this right. So if I do, um, if I do create, if I do make the mistake, which I didn't realize was a mistake until now, but if I do make the mistake of putting 4,000 VLANs into a VXLAN, then that VXLAN becomes. Well, I guess it's the same if I if I trunk two switches together exactly. and I put 4,000 VLANs. Yeah, exactly. The broadcasts are going to go over that link yes. anyway. Okay. All right. We good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. All right. Here we go. A little different track this time, though. So what you just told us makes sense to me for traffic which is required to flood. Yeah, two seconds. But what about VM generated IP multicasts? In a, in a physical switching environment, we have a mechanism to suppress that so it doesn't, go to, it doesn't flood throughout the VLAN. So, so the mechanism I'm describing here, right, I haven't completed it yet, oh. right, is designed for, is, is specific for the category of traffic for broadcast, yep. multicast, and unknown unicast coming from the virtual machine. So that means that an IP multicast generated by the VM is going to be delivered to every ESX host. Well, an it's, IP it's multicast, yeah. right, is handled by the layer three mechanism, no, right? Ah, no, ah, VM ah, multicast, not a VM multicast intra subnet. Okay, that's a, that's regular multicast, right? Ah, yeah. Yes, yeah. but in the regular in traditional switching environment, we have things like uh, IGMP snooping, snooping that go. prevent the uh, the flooding scope of that multicast. Yeah, so in right, right here with the blues, yeah. If the if the, the blue VM in the middle yeah. is not subscribed to the multicast. Do we deliver that package? Yep. To so, the so we basically turn multicast and broadcast, defeating the whole purpose of the multicast. That's my question. So the fact that this blue VM is on the same VXLAN, it means that any sort of uh, multicast traffic as well is handled in the same fashion. Namely, of interest. namely, it's being multicasted by the IP, outer IP infrastructure so that it's sent only to the server in the middle in this case and not to that server on the right. But even the server in the middle doesn't want it. But the server in the middle, you're in, okay, so you're asking whether it's IGMP. I don't know the answer to that. We can have, check, check with my engineer. Well, the, the question actually is, do you do IGMP snooping, snooping within, within a VXLAN? Uh, VX yeah. 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 I think we probably do. I'll double check. Okay. Because, because we do that. In, because this in this case, the problem that, that, uh, that you're describing is not obvious because we have only two hosts and we have a sender on the left. Let's I say. would speculate that we do currently yeah. because we do IGMP snooping for traditional layer VLAN traffic, mm -hmm. right? So. I just don't know what my engineers did. No, but, but, but this would be a, this would be a lot more difficult to do because you would actually have to dig deep. You have to go way into, past. You would have to go way past all the headers yeah. that you have to understand the original frame. Good thing I'm doing this in software. Okay. <laughs> 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 well played, sir. Well played. Well played. Well played. But, but it's not though. It's 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 the responsibility of, of this switch uh, to know to suppress the traffic. No, this thing it only knows about the IP multicast. It's this this thing in here that understands the VXLAN. But nobody on that host wants this traffic. Therefore, this virtual Ethernet module can potentially do IGMP snooping, preventing it from going to this particular blue database. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. But we've right. just burned the physical link unnecessarily. Sure. Right. But this is this is also happening on if you, if you do traditional VLAN. Forget VXLAN at the moment, right? What you described is still true. That is, the IGMP snooping it can take place on a Nexus 1000V virtual Ethernet module, preventing that packet to go to every virtual machine on that server, yep. right, that may not always all subscribe to that particular multicast group, right? But if I don't want the packet to even arrive at the VEM, 
them. I want the then physical the, switch. Then, switch. depending on your multicast protocol, that particular server may, shouldn't have been sent in the first place, right? And that's just upstream physical switch multicast issue, right? To be able yeah. to send it to the server in the first place, right? You can solve it. You would need a different physical multicast group for that's every virtual multicast yeah. group. Or, or at and least that, a pool of that them. just doesn't scale. Yeah. Okay. This sounds like an interesting blog post. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now I'm beginning to better appreciate the motivation of this I audience here, right? you not to use multicast on virtual machines. <laughs> I can't stop them. So once you've actually, um, let's see, which part, which part am I, right? Uh, this is the multicast stuff, right? And now, the next time, uh, okay, so the next time, so now the multicast groups are able to send the traffic to the uh, server in the middle in this case, right? They'll do the learning, so the next time when it needs to send something back, it'll send it directly back via unicast without leveraging multicast. And I have a more detailed example coming up. Okay. Assuming this was an ARP example? If it's ARP, it's a broadcast thing, right? So you treat it the same way. Okay. Now, there was a question earlier, hey, VX, I got 24 bit of VX line ID, 16 million architectural maximum, but my routers may not have 16 million multicast group, right? And so therefore, does the number of multicast group limit, you know, impose a practical, pragmatic deployment limit on the number of VX lands that I can have? That was your, did I capture your question correctly? Um, I think that was actually Tony's question, but. Okay, so I think there was a. Wait, sorry, no, I was asking about the number of multicast trees you can have in the pool. And therefore, the number of multicast groups yeah. that your IP physical network can support and does that impose a practical deployment limit yeah. on the number of VX land that you might have as a part of a real deployment, yeah. right? so I'm not talking about, so that's more of a long-term picture. So if I was building a cloud infrastructure, I might want to have, say, 200 uh, 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 zones, security zones, each one using a VLAN ID. Now, if I start to scale to 500, then I would need 500 multicast trees over, say, a five-year as my infrastructure built. Is my physical infrastructure capable of hosting 500 multicast trees. So let me show you, walk you through this example. In this example, I have the blue and the red VXLAN sharing the same multicast group. Right? Assume for a moment that I'm running out of multicast group so that I'm forced to share. What happens in this case? Right? So now, when I, the blue web VM sends a broadcast, it's being dutifully multicasted by the routing infrastructure. It sends it to the server in the middle, and it also sends it to the server on the right. Now, the, serv the virtual Ethernet module on the right will receive this packet. It's like, oh, gosh, I just received a broadcast packet for a blue VXLAN ID. I don't have any virtual machine that needs, that's on blue VXLAN. Therefore, this virtual Ethernet module will drop this packet. Now, you might say that, gee, Han, that's not very efficient because you just sent this thing to a server that doesn't need it. And you're absolutely right. It is less efficient to be able to be uh, sharing multicast groups. However, the broadcast domains continue to be respected. That is, I did not send a blue VXLAN broadcast traffic to a red VM, right? It is less efficient, right? And if I were to think through this, right, in the limiting case, assume for a moment that I have all 16 million VXLANs using exactly one broadcast, well, multicast group. What happens then? Well, that kind of degenerates down to broadcast, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So what right? you're saying is, if you have a physical infrastructure that has a, so what I'm seeing here is this is a, 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 a way of handling the scalability limit of multicast trees. You could, if you, if you had that many VXLAN IDs in deployment, reuse or overload your existing multicast trees according to some plan yep. while we waited for the hardware to catch up with more multicast trees that would have been a better way to go. By the way, the, the reason that we chose to use multicast is so that we're leveraging the routing hardware infrastructure yeah. to do packet duplication yeah, rather than doing this in a software virtual switch, right? So most of our customers today have IP multicast infrastructure already deployed in their data centers and we're merely using that hardware for the purposes of... Yeah, I perceive that there's yeah. two imperatives there. Well, one is that 
Cisco has a functioning multicast infrastructure in hardware which works performantly and is also a value prop to your customers. But as but what you're also saying is that the extra software load to do the packet replication in software is not efficient and doing it in hardware is more efficient. As a Nexus 1000 software switch, I'm constantly being asked by my customer, you know, especially with the, given the heritage of Cisco's hardware switching capabilities. You know, when, in fact, when I first introduced Nexus 1000, it's like, Han, are you sure you're from Cisco? You're pitching a software switch? I haven't heard a software switch from Cisco in I don't know how long. And then I have to explain that, well, in a virtualized environment, it's actually advantageous to have a software switch because you have increasing amount of virtual machine density yeah. tracking Moore's law and therefore having software switch is actually more efficient in this virtualized world. So, so therefore, as a, Nexus, as a software switch, we're always trying to be more efficient, right, given the capability and the context that we're applying the technologies, right? So therefore, we're using the hardware in this case, the routing hardware to do the packet of duplication, Minimizing the amount of stuff that we have to do in software, right? Uh, I, I yes. I have a question uh, regarding the cloud director integration. I know that you can specify the multicast groups manually if you configure this on Nexus 1000V. So you can decide what you want to be shared, what you want to be separate based on the amount of the broadcast traffic you expect to see in one VXLAN. But if you provision these things through vCloud Director, VXLAN back pools, how are the multicast groups allocated there? We actually specify a range okay. of multicast group, mm -hmm. and then it's used in a round robin fashion. So every new VXLAN ID that vCloud Director generates needs, <coughs> let's say, you create a new VXLAN ID and you just take the next multicast express from the range, uh, round robin. Round robin. Okay. Next question. Uh, can you synchronize that between two VSMs? Or does the whole thing have to stay within the scope of one VSM? So, good. I, I, I know you can go between two VSMs if you manually configure multicast groups. No problem there. But if you do that through vCloud Director, so if you have two VSMs, right? Yeah. That's actually, you can actually have a single vCloud director mm -hmm. and you know, managing multiple uh, vSphere clusters mm -hmm. that actually have Nexus 1000 be associated yeah. with each of those vSphere clusters. Okay. Okay. So then you might have two pairs of active standby VSM. As a result, uh -huh. the, the multicast groups will probably be assigned in a non overlapping fashion. Okay. Okay so that the VXLAN's multicast groups of VSM mm -hmm. domain A is different than VSM domain okay. B, right? Makes sense. Allowing you to kind yeah. of continue to scale mm -hmm. appropriately. Did I answer your question? No. No, okay. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, uh, as for another one, so thank you for that one. <laughs> right. uh, now, if I want to deploy the same VXLAN segment ah. between two VSMs for, let's say, high availability purposes. So that, provisioning problem is not just related to Nexus 1000V, but also implies there are some implications on vCloud Director exactly. as well, right? Yeah. So therefore, the vCloud Director needs to be aware that, ooh, I need to deploy this particular VXLAN uh, across two separate... The VDSs. Uh, VDSs, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not good enough of a VCD guy to, to answer your question, but I can follow up with that. Okay, thank you. Right. Fair enough. Five minutes. I got five minutes. Got five what? Minutes. Okay. So, my apologies, I won't be able to walk you through the uh, particular Mac learning tables of the Mac and I, the excellent IP addresses, yeah, yeah. but I think at the high level, hopefully the audience here will already understand uh, <laughs> the learning capability that we're talking about as part of the excellent ID. Oh, no, no. don't skip the configs. No. <laughs> 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 this is actually how you do the configuration on the Nexus 1000V. Uh, I won't walk you through a lot of this, but you actually have to tie the particular uh, things to the vCloud director as you do all this stuff, right? And this, there's actually a lot more to, to share and to talk about as part of the configuration and integration of VC, vCloud director and uh, the Nexus. Segment ID, the VXLAN ID? Yeah. Okay. Now, let me kind of, uh -huh. let me kind of jump you to some controversial things. Okay. 
because I think you'll uh, <laughs> <laughs> for a change. Yeah. So VXLAN is designed to work with scalable network isolation, particularly within a data center. And because of the multicast requirement that we just talked about, you probably don't want to use a capital I internet. Right? Uh -huh. So if you have two da different data centers, right, you probably want to use some sort of a data center extension, of which OTV is an example that Victor will talk about in four minutes. Right? And that type of thing will enable physical workloads, traditional VLANs, and even VXLANs to work between two different data centers. Uh, no. 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 So, so it's tunnels all the way down? <laughs> VXLAN over OTV over MPLS over ATM, it's all. <laughs> Do I hear a note of dissension? Omar, oh, are you sure you won't give me only four minutes? I'm, I'm such a, engaging such a lively audience here. <laughs> No, no, uh, uh, so you're actually proposing to transport IP multicast, which is already IP, over an OTB tunnel, which is also IP, just so that you, just because you don't have an IP multicast enabled core. Well, if you have an IP multicast ISP, you can certainly do this. Oh, yeah, like they're both in the world. <laughs> okay, and then, and then oh, by the way, in, in those two ISP instances, <laughs> your other ISP customers might also plan to see your broadcast traffic through the multicast. Yeah, sure. It might not be a good thing. You know, yeah, just, sure. <laughs> you know, just up to you, <laughs> right? But most customers yeah, don't, have, have, don't like that very much, right? Here, right? So this is the kind of thing that we could do well, to make sure that VXLAN works with data center ex extension technique, right? And I also want to share with you one more thing. What we're actually shipping today is the fact that you can have traffic running on top of VXLAN on the Nexus 1000V. Through the use of VPATH, you can even have virtual security gateway that's shipping now, protecting and providing virtual firewall services for traffic on top of VXLAN. Uh, it's actually pretty important to make sure that you're not just doing switching, but you're doing network services as well. Now, this is, this is ultra cool, and I love this, but does this work with vCloud Directory? Actually, it does. Really? Yeah. So you can kick out vShield app? We have always worked with VMware <laughs> on you. such okay. a capabilities, <laughs> right? In fact, as part, you guys are, you have an interesting audience here, Omar. <laughs> Uh, in That's fact, the from a thing ever <laughs> <laughs> you're doing fine. <laughs> oh yes. From a Cisco perspective, this slide was shared at VMware last year by executives on both Cisco and VMware, articulating the fact that Cisco is commit and VMware are committed to having a uh, networking stack in a vCloud infrastructure environment. Initially, with Nexus 1000V working with the vShield, but we're both companies are working towards a. Uh, green stack show on the far right where you have Nexus 1000V, ASA 1000V, and also Cisco Network Services Manager giving the customer additional networking options in the vCloud environment. Okay. <laughs> Super. Okay. So I see that my time is up. And so therefore. So we got a couple things to follow up on. Um, I did this new thing within the X land. Uh -huh. um, what else? But uh, Chris had a Chris had an interesting comment about it's going back to multicast, right? And and I I also had one, one thing. I mean, the, the whole multicast the whole multicast design really reminds me of what we had in MPLS VPNs. And there they solved the problem of replicating unnecessary data to where it to to the nodes that it doesn't have to go by actually having the data MDT trees. So the nodes that were interested in some data they would join a particular tree. Now this. Those are much more expensive links, but it still uh, seems like we're no, solving. But this could be, uh, this can be used for unknown, unica uh, unknown unicast and broadcast flooding, but it can be used for customer generated, the VM generated multicast traffic. Mm -hmm. So there, there could be some lessons to be learned from, from MPLS VPNs there, just saying. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. And I think part of, you know, apart from our perspective, we see a whole host of different use cases. Mm -hmm. So I think at some point we'd kind of bias towards giving people flexibility because it's not, hey, you know, a lot of this is still, you know, partially baked. So not a solid use case, best design practice that 80% of the market uses. Everyone's kind of doing their own things. So kind of, I mean, like the last VMware slide, we're kind of giving folks the maximum amount of flexibility until some of this stuff starts to fall out. I have a question. Yes. Um, I see. I saw in your diagrams there's really two two different networks. There was a VLAN side network 
and there was, and then you drew on the back side the VX LAN network. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why wouldn't you just go all VX LAN on one side, and then be able to terminate a VX LAN, like uh, do some kind of VX LAN to VLAN translation, or have a VX LAN SVI or IRB on the physical switch? Great question. Um, what I didn't have an opportunity to share with you today is the fact that in using a tunneling technique like VXLAN, you do need to have a gateway to transport a packet from the traditional VLAN world into the VXLAN world, right? And some of the networking attributes associated with that type of VXLAN gateway capability, right? So perhaps next time, Omar, we can talk about that in a little more detail. So one of the things we can do, um, you guys can chat about it. If you want to do some follow-up, to kind of scratch the surface, and certainly there's other things we want to dig in deeper on, we can pull together WebEx, get a couple of TMEs on there as well, and yeah. if you want to do like an hour follow-up session. Um, Mr. Foskett, if you want to, or yes. if someone wants to take part, or Greg, yeah. if you want to take point, talking uh, about it. You know, I'll chat, we'll just pull it together, and mm -hmm. we can, yeah. you know, take so it together. Oh, you see, there is interest in VX then. Yes, there is. Yeah. So if you, you want to swap in, yeah. yeah, and uh, and we're going to be talking about some of these interactions in the next yeah. hour. And Hans is going to stay around, since he's having so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be around. Make sure I get uh, wear more armor protection. <laughs> no, you did good. Uh, it just, 